Back in the 80s and 90s in the US, there was a rapid rise in the popularity of cable television. Cable television provided several advantages over over-the-air transmission, including higher quality video that wasn't impacted by atmospheric conditions and more channels. As at the time, technology and practice within the US typically only allowed 7 to 12 over-the-air channels to be available in an area. Cable, on the other hand, was able to offer dozens of channels providing far more options to consumers. However, instead of cable subscribers picking and choosing which channels they wanted, a la carte style, cable companies would offer channels as bundles. A cable bundle might have 30, 50, 100 plus channels, though a given household might only ever frequently watch a dozen or so of these channels. All the other unwatched channels would be noise and extra cost. 200 channels and nothing but cats. As the JDK increased in functionality over successive versions, it was also beginning to fall victim to a similar issue of bundling too much functionality together. Desktop application developers could develop a powerful GUI using AWT and Swing APIs, but probably didn't have much need for JDBC APIs. Whereas web application developers would make heavy use of JDBC, HTTP, and network security APIs, but have little need for either Swing or AWT. One attempt at resolving this issue was the creation of compact profiles with JEP161 and JDK8, which, as the summary states, would create profiles that were subsets of the Java SC platform, primarily aimed at allowing Java to run on small devices. What was delivered were three compact profile runtimes, each building upon the former, and then the standard runtime profile that provided access to the full Java SC API. This was a limited solution, however. If, for example, you were creating a simple application that processed XML files, even though almost all this functionality would be handled by the core and XML JAXP APIs, you would need to use either the Compact2 or Compact3 profiles, depending upon which XML JAXP APIs you used. Or, if you were building an application that read from a database containing images and then processing on those images, you'd primarily only need the core JDBC and ImageIO APIs, but be forced into using the entire Java SE runtime because that's where the ImageIO API was located. Developers needed an ad hoc way of creating a custom Java runtime that fit the specific needs of their applications, a functionality provided by JLink, Java's custom runtime builder, the subject of this episode of Stackwalker. If you're interested in learning more about JLink, other Java topics, or how to find a local Java users group, and more, be sure to check out dev.java, link in the description. Before we talk about JLink, we need to talk about Java modules. Java modules is a topic for a Stackwalker video onto itself, maybe even two. You can even do something crazy and write a book about the subject. And who knows, maybe that book would be referenced as a tongue-in-cheek joke in a YouTube video some years later, but I digress. Let's just cover the high-level portions of Java modules as they relate to JLink. Java modules came out of Project Jigsaw, which began back in August of 2008. For once, we are discussing a technology that actually started after I became a professional developer. Anyways, Project Jigsaw has four big overarching goals. Make it easier for developers to construct and maintain libraries and large applications. Improve the security and maintainability of the Java platform improve application performance, and enable the Java platform and the JDK to be scaled down to better fit in embedded and cloud deployments. These goals were primarily implemented through JEPS 200, the modular JDK, and JEP 261, the module system. Let's first focus on JEP 200, which used the Java platform system, or JPM. Wait, what was that? Oh, right. So anyways, JEP200 modularized the JDK. This was necessary as before the release of JDK9, the JDK was in a bit of an architectural rough spot, resembling your typical monolithic application with dependencies crossing every which way. Like with other monolithic applications, this made sense at the time. As the JDK was being shipped as a single artifact, there was relatively little harm in creating ad hoc relationships between different parts of the JDK. Though this obviously posed a problem towards modularizing the JDK and allowing for custom runtimes to be created. The final outcome of JEP200, when delivered as part of JDK9, was a JDK that was transformed into a rel structured modularized entity with 19 discrete modules, which have clearly defined one way dependencies. 
In the time since JDK 9, two new modules have been added to the Java SE specification, Java Transaction XA and Java Net HTTP, both added in JDK 11. The path to creating a customized runtime containing only the code your application needed is now clear, but we are not quite there yet, and indeed not yet experiencing the full benefit either. Returning to JEP 261, which defined the module system, also included in this JEP was the addition of a new optional phase in the creation of a Java application, link time. Link time is kind of like brunch. It's optional and exists between two more commonly known periods. It's not quite compile time, not quite run time, but a phase where you can perform whole world optimizations. And the program you use during the link time phase would be a linker. A linker is a computer program that links, or combines, modules together into an executable image. This allows the modules a linker is combining to be separated into discrete entities, allowing for clear separation of responsibilities. For the project that has been divided up, easier to manage since it's no longer a single monolithic entity, and for consumers of the project, the ability to use only the modules they need. Additionally, this new link time phase allows an additional opportunity for optimizations and customizations to be applied to a runtime image that would be difficult to perform at compile time and costly at runtime, a topic we will return to a bit later in this video. As you have hopefully already guessed, the JDK linker implementation is called JLink. JLink was also part of JDK 9, which included all the other key Java modules changes, and was defined in JEP 2A2. JLink is a command line tool located in the bin directory of your JDK install and used for creating a custom runtime image. At its most basic level, JLink would take two options, add modules, which defines which modules from the JMod directory should be used in the new runtime, and output, which defines the name and location of the resulting runtime that JLink creates. A very basic program like Hello World can be run with a Java custom runtime image containing only the Java base module, like shown in this example. The Java launcher contained in the runtime image we created isn't anything special, and if we pass the version option to it, it produces the same output as the standard JDK21 image. So this is all well and good, but why go through the extra steps of using JLink? We can answer this question by first looking at the size comparison of the runtime images. No, I am using the sizes for an Intel-based Mac OS. If we were to look at the size of the standard JDK21 directory, it would be 324 megabytes. Though if we narrow that down to just the contents of the lib directory, which contains the actual functional parts of the runtime, it would be 242 megabytes. If we inspect the size of the base image we just created containing only Java base, it would clock in at 48 megabytes, which brings us to the first and most easy to quantify advantage of JLink. It uses less disk space through the straightforward fact of you be creating a runtime image containing only a subset of the full Java SE API. Next, if we were to inspect what happens when executing the Hello World program using the custom image versus the standard Java image, we'd see the custom image executes slightly faster and uses slightly less memory. So there are some small benefits in the areas of startup and memory footprint. The benefit seen here is primarily derived from the JVM loading fewer modules at startup, as the JLink image contains only Java base, while the standard image of course contains all the modules within the Java SE API. In real world use cases, the benefit would be even smaller as you'd be depending upon more modules and the relative impact of loading modules would be smaller as there would likely be more business behavior occurring within an application during startup. Still, I guess it's nice to have, right? Finally, and this one is a bit harder to demonstrate in this video, but you'd be more secure. This is simply a result of having a smaller attack surface area. Hackers, as crafty as they might be, can't exploit what they can't see, or, well, what simply isn't there. However, not every program is as simple as Hello World, and even slightly more complex programs like Hello Dependencies here, which calls an endpoint and prints a response and URL being called to the Java logger, is going to fail if you attempt to run it with an image containing only the Java base module. This is because the class Hello Dependencies contains references to classes outside the Java base module. This creates a bit of an issue. 
Manually cross-referencing which classes are located in which modules would be a laborious task even in this relatively simple example, and basically impossible when bringing in third-party libraries, as we will see in a few moments. So how would a developer know which of the 21 modules to include in their custom runtime? JLink is used for creating custom runtimes as we saw in the previous section. But to create those custom runtimes, it needs to know which modules to include. This task would fall to the responsibility of the JDEPS command line tool. By default, JDEPS can provide a printout of the module dependencies for an application. Using the hello dependencies class example from earlier, most class references point to Java base. However, classes under the Java net HTTP package are located under the Java net HTTP modules. And classes located under the Java util logging package are located in the Java logging module. JDEPS provides options for refining the output, such as the print module depths option, which produces output that can be copied into the add modules options for JLink. Like seen here for creating a new custom runtime, hello dependencies image, which can be used to successfully execute the hello dependencies class. In real world scenarios where you are working on applications that have third party library dependencies, you will need to provide a class path, including the dependencies your application will be pulling in, as well as telling JDEPS to scan those dependencies recursively to find all the needed modules. Of course, it's nothing new that even relatively simple projects, in this case, a Spring Boot project using the web security and JDPC data packages can have a very large and complex class path. Luckily, build tools like Maven have plugins that can print this class path out for you. Returning back to this example, running the JDEPS command would produce a report far too long to be usefully shown here. The eagle-eyed among you might notice the inclusion of an extra tag at the end of this command, multi-release. In brief, this tag is referring to multi-release jars, another feature delivered as a part of JDK 9. Multi-release jars allow a jar to contain classes from multiple versions of the JDK. In the previous example, at least one of the libraries on the class path was published as a multi-release jar, and JDEPS needs to know which class versions to use to know which classes to scan for dependencies. All right, back to JDEPS. When telling JDEPS to print out the required modules shows how even basically simple projects can start requiring a large number of modules, as would be the case using the simple Spring Boot example from earlier, which brings in 11 modules. Though if you feel some of the modules are unlikely to be needed in your application, JDEPS can be used to interrogate which dependencies are using which modules, like here for checking which dependencies are requiring the java.scripting module. And in this case, it's only two references from two dependencies. And it might be that these references are never executed during the lifetime of your application. So the java.scripting module could be omitted from your runtime image. How much time and effort to spend checking if every module is truly required is only something that can be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, but is worth keeping in mind. While the basic behavior of JLink, creating a custom runtime image, is handled by the core JLink tool, a considerable amount of benefit of JLink is delivered through its plugins. As of JDK21, there are 20 JLink plugins. Available plugins can be viewed with the list plugins option, the above omitting the descriptions of the plugins for space reasons. Plugins allow for additional customization of the runtime image JLink produces, including compression, adding arguments files to be passed to the JVM on startup, generating a CDS archive, and more. If you want to learn more about CDS, check out my episode of Stackwalker on that topic. Let's take a look at how the JLink plugin can modify the size and performance of the runtime images it produces. For reference, the standard JDK21 image is 324 megabytes, 242 when only considering the lib directory. The size of the image JLink creates for the Spring Boot app when using no plugins is 109 megabytes. We can also see that the JLink image is a little faster at startup and uses a little less memory, but you can see how the relative benefits are even less than when compared to the Hello World example. If improving startup performance was a higher priority than saving disk space, which will likely often be the case, you could generate a CDS archive. This moderately increases the image size to 137 megabytes. However, the addition of the CDS archive results in a slightly faster startup, 
though at a cost of higher memory usage when compared to a JLink image without a CDS archive. JLink offers options for compressing the runtime image. In this case, this is doing the maximum amount of compression, which reduces the image size to 59 megabytes, but slightly increases both startup time and memory footprint. The JLink plugins provide a lot of options for customizing the runtime image JLink produces to better fit the needs of your application. If you would like to know more about JLink plugins, be sure to check out the dev.java link in the description for our JLink tutorial that provides a bit more detail on using JLink plugins. One last part before we start to wrap up. Developers, particularly developers of desktop applications, can go a step farther with JLink and package both their application and runtime into a single artifact. Like in this example, packaging up the simple Spring Boot application as a .app file that can be executed on a Mac OS system. Albeit in this case, this application wouldn't do much as it doesn't have a GUI. JPackage can only build an artifact for the platform it is on, so to build a Windows application, JPackage would need to be run on a Windows platform. JLink will continue to evolve on an as-needed basis in the future. One project that JLink will certainly play an important role in is Project Leiden, a project that is aiming to improve startup, time to peak performance, and footprint of Java applications, all areas that relate to the goals of JLink. Though it's still early to know exactly what changes will come to JLink as a result of Project Leiden. It's starting to feel something like a trend at this point with Stackwalker, diving into a powerful and useful tool that isn't particularly new, but has gone chronically overlooked by the Java community. And that trend seems to be continuing with JLink. The ability to create a custom runtime image containing only the functionality your application requires provides many benefits that are high priorities in a tech ecosystem now of using less disk space, faster startup, smaller memory footprint, and more secure. All benefits are rather deploying Java applications to the cloud, on embedded devices, or even as desktop applications. Well, that's it for this episode of Stackwalker. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment if you have ideas for future Stackwalker episodes or if you want to share your experience when using JLink. Until next time, have a good one.